Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Sherry, and thanks to Bee Culture for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. And a quick thanks to all of our sponsors whose support enables us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Make sure to check out all of our other content on our website. There you can read up on all of our guests, read our blog on various aspects and observations about beekeeping, search for, download, and listen to over 200 past episodes, read episode transcripts, (laughs) leave comments and feedback on each show, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. So, Kim, you guys have been sitting there in Ohio. The rest of us are freezing in this cold winter snap. You guys have had some, enjoyed some warm weather. How is it today? Well, today it got to 70. Tomorrow it's going to be 30. (laughs) So so, uh, you, you enjoy it when you can. Actually, you know, jumping up and down like that is actually worse for me than just a straight 40 degrees. I'd be real happy with that. And I think that's what we're going to get after this. Well, come out to Washington State. It's a solid 40 degrees. Well, I may do that. Okay. (laughs) This coming weekend, you and Jim will be at the Tri-County Meeting in Wooster, Ohio. Isn't that correct? Yeah, Jim, too, and I will be there. Uh, If you're going to be there, stop in, say hi. Uh, We'd like to talk to you and and, uh, maybe get some ideas. You got some ideas of people we should be talking to on this broadcast or uh, things that Jimmy and I should be talking about on that broadcast. Yeah, so if uh, anybody's going to be in the Wooster, Ohio area or have the opportunity to go to the Tri-County meeting the week, the first weekend in March, make sure you stop in and say hi to Kim and Jim and see what they're up to. Sign some books. Say hi. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing neat about the Tri-County, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, there'll be a lot of vendors there, and and you'll be able to see some of the latest and greatest technology. Uh, I don't think our next guest will be there, but speaking of technology, Hive Tracks is one of the early adopters of uh, technology and and creating management tools for beekeepers. And uh, in our upcoming show here today, we have James Wilkes and the new CEO Max. I can't remember his last name. You know, I'm almost uh, I'm almost waiting. I'm waiting to hear that when Hive Tracks starts using a- using AI to to make their programs work because. Uh, they're doing a good job. They're ahead of the curve, I think. You're right. I think if anybody uses AI, the first people to do it will be Hive Tracks. Yep. All right, let's get right into it. But first, a quick word from our friends at Hive Alive and Strong Microbials. Spring brings wild and unpredictable weather. To limit the chance of colony starvation before your first honey flow, it is vital to add Hive Alive fondant now. In a cold snap, bees can starve because they cannot access their stores. When you place fondant right over the cluster, food is accessible for your bees when they need it. Now is the perfect time to stock up from a wide selection of high-quality honeybee feed supplements you can choose from Hive Alive's liquid blend to our Hive Alive 15% real pollen fondant patties. Our unique liquid blend has seaweed extracts, thyme, and lemongrass and is scientifically proven to maintain low disease levels. You'll have more bees with improved bee gut health and more honey this season. To learn more about each of our quality products, visit the website www.us.com. 
usa.hivealivebees.com. Be sure to use the code BTP at the checkout to receive your special discount. Hey, beekeepers! Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is a good friend of the show, James Wilkes of Hive Tracks and Max Runzel, also of Hive Tracks. Welcome, guys, to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here again and uh, look forward to our. Fun conversation as usual. Yeah, thanks for the warm welcome. Really happy to be here. Glad to have you here, Max. Yeah, James, it's not springtime unless we see you on the show. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say it's springtime, but it's, springtime is approaching. Like all beekeepers, this time of year, we're getting a little antsy and ready, ready for it to take off. It's 18 here today, Jeff, up in northern Ohio. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're going cold tonight. We're getting that from you. From your direction, Kim. Hits I'm up. happy to share. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, James, we asked you to come back to the show. Well, not only because it's now tradition after four or five years, but Hive Track continues to evolve and change and grow and get better. Why don't you tell our new listeners who is Hive Tracks, and then we can go into what's new. Sure. So Hive Tracks is a beekeeping software created by beekeepers for beekeepers. We've been at it since 2010 and continue to reimagine our, our software and help beekeepers you know, do a better job of keeping their bees healthy. We've really changed a lot in the last two years. I mean, we talked some last year about some of the changes and we just continue to iterate on that and using everything we've learned over the past dozen years or so to keep up with the technology as well as keep up with the beekeepers and where we think they are in terms of their adoption of technology and, and things like that. We've talked about that multiple times in the past. And just the bee technology space itself continues to, I guess, accelerate, you would say, just all the interesting new things that are out there we're keeping up with. I've also got, as you mentioned, Max Runzel here with us today. I don't think he's been on the podcast before, but he's he's not new to Hive Tracks. We've I've been working with Max since 2020, the spring, and then officially about a year after that, he came on with us full time and is now CEO of Hive Tracks. So I'll let Max say a little bit about himself as well, if that's okay. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks a lot, James. Yeah, so as 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 James was saying, my name is Max Runzel. I have a background in rural development and food and resource economics, actually. And as you may have picked up already, you know, I was born and raised in Europe, so I'm half Swedish, half German. And I right out of, you know, going the the ag econ line, I moved to Rome, Italy to work for the UN, so for the Food and Agriculture Organization. And I was in the research and extension unit where we mostly worked in beekeeping. So kind of what technologies and practices can smallholder beekeepers around the world adopt. And, and very quickly, kind of, we got to this point where we were confined by, you know, a lack of technology, a lack of vision, which was round about exactly when, when James came along and gave a presentation, gave a talk at a round table at, you know, we were talking about how bee data can help with the sustainable development goals. And, you know, we clicked and started working together. It was, you know, one of the, one of the many topics of how can we catalyze? How can we get the right advice that beekeepers need at the right time in their hand to their hands? through technology in a smart way. And that got us excited in the, in the first place. And it took us about a year or so to figure out 
how to work together. Then, you know, the big, the big March 2020 happened that we all remember. So all of a sudden it was, it was me in my little, you know, in my childhood room in Germany instead of <laughs> being in, in Boone, North Carolina, where I'm, I'm based now since I got my visa last year. And yeah, so, you know, proud, proud resident over here and finally in the same time zone and very, very happy to be here and on this journey with James together and the rest of the Hytrex team. Welcome to the show and welcome to uh, Boone, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to meet you, Max. No, likewise. It's a big pleasure. I've been listening to many episodes, and James has always been telling me about us. Like Max, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna meet some, some, some beacons of the beekeeping space today. So I was quite excited to meet the two of you. <laughs> and so you're meeting with them after the podcast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was this morning. We had coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're here today, and Jeff brought it up before, what your organization has been doing up until now, and now you and Max are kind of, I'm not going to say going in a different direction, but going in, what's the word I want here? Because you're still looking at gathering data and interpreting that data so that it can be used by beekeepers, but what are you guys up to? Yeah, let me let me just reiterate that we've we've not lost any of the original kind of vision that I had, which I'm super happy that we're able to continue and be grounded in that and, and, you know, be advocates for the beekeepers and, you know, providing them tools and things that they can use to make their beekeeping better. But we've put that into a bigger context, I would say, is, is what in a bigger vision that goes way beyond the beekeeper, but it, it recognizes the value and actually what we're trying to do is create an environment where the beekeeper's actions is recognized for the value that it creates in terms of pollination services and just or the more general term eco- ecosystem services that people are talking about now and the impact that has on the environment and and recognizing that articulating that and and so continue to build tools and we've rebuilt our whole technology stack once again and we can talk more about that and would love to tell you some about the interesting new twists we have there that we think are going to have a, a big impact this coming season and I'll let Max take it from there and talk just a little bit more about the kind of umbrella vision that we have the the, the key piece really is to to understand what what beekeepers do out there every day on a weekly on a on a, on a two week basis, like wh- how can we take what is happening as we almost call it like a human biodiversity interaction, right? So it's hundreds of thousands of people who go out every week and observe and and keep track and see how their bees are doing, interact with their bees, interact with the environment, and as that happens. This is an, an a, a humongous impact on biodiversity. It's like it's the backbone of what keep our ecosystems healthy. And the question there then becomes, you know, how why can we account for that? Why can't we recognize that effort by beekeepers around the world in the same manner that it's being recognized in the agricultural space? Because there is value to 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 what beekeepers do in these areas and what it means for for our biodiversity and our our ecosystems as they work. So a lot of the thinking that we are doing is how can we equip beekeepers with the the tools and the proof of the effect of what they do as a positive impact on the environment around them. And that is, you know, in in different direction. One is is sort of an authentication of, of where these services are being delivered and where you make an impact on the environment. And that can either help with showing where your honey comes from. It can showing with what your impact on the environment was. Why shouldn't you be compensated as a beekeeper for what you're doing by protecting the biodiversity in a decentralized manner somewhere in the world, right? There's, there's so much that, that you're doing on a, on a, on a basis. So that's really what we're concerned about is to see. Can we, can we show the work of beekeepers beyond a honey production in a way that nobody has done before? So to, to give beekeepers the recognition that they, that they deserve, both in, you know, in, in terms of being able to see what they did, but also to be able to incentivize it financially at some point that we have thousands of beekeepers who, who do what needs to get done to keep our ecosystems healthy. It sounds like you're trying to shoot at a moving target. 
because the biodiversity that you are measuring today, next season may not be there. The 500-pound gorilla here is climate change. What you'll be able to measure next year is the change that happened between this year's measurements and what you got. And is that part of your program, looking at how the world is moving faster than we want it to? Absolutely. It's, it's, part of this is, one, creating a data framework, if you will, right? We, we know that there's connections between beekeepers and, and, well, really the honeybees activities themselves and the environment in which they're in. I mean, they're pollinating, right? And they're, which creates life, which multiplies, you know, the flora in the area. Right. And the the health of the bees, the pollen that they're collecting, the the honey that they're producing are all measures of what's going on in that ecosystem around them. And so having that data then creates the opportunity to do what you're talking about. What are the deltas from one season to the next? If we don't even have a baseline data, right, then how are we going to measure any changes? And so. First order is getting that baseline data that really simply creates a digital version of what's happening in the in the, for the beekeeper in their in their bee yard in the tech space. It's like this digital twin <laughs> of what's happening in the bee yard. We we are able to capture enough of that right to get a sense of what's going on with the bees, the beekeeper, their health, and then you can layer over top of that or join with that third-party data sources, whether it's the weather or land use in the area, or agri- which would include agricultural use, that sort of thing. So it's it's really a mashup of the B data and then these other sources. And, and to see what that tells us, again, we don't, we've not had the opportunity to look at that kind of data before. So that, that's, that's the idea. I, I think, I mean, Kim, your question is so spot on. It's like, you know, how do you how do you measure a moving target, right? How do you how do you keep track of that? And to, to us, the the solution to that is just a decentralized version of of allowing a, a crowdsourcing of the type of data, right? So the the key the new key piece in our technology will be to to learn from your environment, to learn from people who are around you, to be able to to learn from what other people are doing in your area, to be able to learn from what other blooms people are recognizing in your area. Because we know that certain, you know, hard and fast rules that we may have had in old beekeeping almanacs or old rules that we knew as soon as we go over this temperature, then, then we know that certain things will happen. Well, that becomes more and more erratic and the events that happen are more and more can be more and more adverse and happen at points where where we can't really see what it is so what we need to be able to rely on is just when a lot of people start to observe say what blooms for example and um, we'll be able in the app to say yep this was confirmed by so many people in my area so i know that the maple for example here now on the east coast is moving slowly moving up uh, the east coast and gives me an indicator for the, the the starting of the season but the same also goes for beekeeping practices in and of itself you know since since some of many of these rules change and the, the temperature changes so the first inspection of the year may change from one season to the next. I want to know when the beekeepers in my area perform the very first inspection. So this type of almost community intelligence is is a key piece which we believe will be essential already, but moving forward even more so because we can't rely anymore on these old wisdoms, so to say, because you know the changing climate is just putting new threats or new challenges in, into our lives as, as as beekeepers. What data are you collecting? And is it manually entered or is it automatically captured? So there's a there's a mix between the two. There's a few that are automatically captured, like the weather data, for example. That is something where where the location collects the weather, the weather information that is that is being pulled in. As for the, the data that we collect manually, we work very closely around the the the, the healthy colony checklist. So we our the key component of our app is the, the so-called inspection process. So these are four big questions around food stores, population size, brood stages, and uh, stressors that we may find. And the interesting aspect how we approached it again is to think 
We want the technology to disappear, right? Nobody likes to enter forms of data. Nobody likes to enter data and not get anything back from it. So there have to be two rules to doing this. One, if I put in data, I want something back, right? Give me, recommend something. Give me some information. Make it work for me. And two is I don't want it to be painful. So when we re reinvented this, you know, the, the, the call and response, the give and take with, with, with the app and this inspection, we said, okay, what if I want to enter the data quickly? And we created a pathway where just with a thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, food store is good, food stage is good, stressors, okay. And you can be through it very, very briefly. You can also record more details because you want to see what the bees are foraging on. You want to not disease, not record any stressors, but you want to go all the way down on the symptom level. Or a third way is I need more guidance. I don't know what unkept brood looks like. Show me what unkept brood looks like. I need a picture of it. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know what a, bad smell can indicate as a symptom and uh, give me that so that's the, the key piece to say we have a little inspection flow just four questions and you have three different ways depending on your you know where you are how much you know how much you've been at beekeeping you're you're able to to take care of that and then all the other to do's and records so we have a few preset ones right so anything from feeding or splitting or requeening journaling, recording symptoms. So if there's a couple that, you know, most beekeepers will recognize that you can either schedule as a to-do piece or or record if it's something that you just observed, uh, observed, if you will. Then, of course, the ability to customize them a little bit. So if there's something that you want to do that that you just did, you can you can add that too. And the interesting, you know, one I talked earlier about, we want the design to work. So we spend a lot of time to to make it make it make it helpful, make it fun, make it engaging. And the other aspect is, you know, what does the app do for me, right? What is the what does the app do for me as a beekeeper when I enter some 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 data? And we've worked very very hard, and this has been actually a very fun piece. You know, we spent many many hours with a huge Google Sheet spreadsheet and, and different thoughts to see what recommendations can there be, right? What what combination between you know frames. Honey, for example, food stores, symptoms, and root stages should trigger what type of action by the beekeeper. So we've, you know, it's almost 500 different recommendations that we've that we've worked in, and that are that will be available in the in the in the in the new app. And they also come with a little recommendation system. So you get a recommendation, and you can either say you like the recommendation or you did not like it. So the goal again is here. We start at a the lower level and working with the beekeepers, we improve the recommendations based on where they are over time. Let's take this quick break for a word from one of our sponsors. Hey, has winter's chill and weather forced you inside? Well, did you know that Better Bee offers winter classes you can take from the comfort of your own home? Our classes are taught by Dr. David Peck, and Eastern Apicultural Society Master Beekeeper Anne Fry. Our classes range from basic courses on essentials of beekeeping all the way up to specifics on planning for the seasons ahead and for your success. Visit betterbee.com forward slash classes to view all of our upcoming learning opportunities. Well, it sounds somewhat like the hive tracks that I'm familiar with, you are collecting data from hopefully thousands of microclimates and joining them and some person or some machine somewhere is going, okay, I'm taking data from here and here and here and here and I'm lumping it together and I'm coming up with, because you're in this microclimate over here, my recommendation to you is going to be different than my recommendation to the person that's 50 miles away in a different microclimate. You've got a machine somewhere that's making these decisions. How do I get my information to your machine and your machine back to me? That's a great question. That's exactly how it works. I mean, again, beekeeping, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, we've learned that about 80% of the beekeeping activities are similar across places. And then there is about 20 to, to a minimum of 20% where it gets more granular, where you say, you know, the, the microclimate comes in. So basically the, the engine that we have takes a couple of if conditions. So a, top, a couple of prerequisites in. And as you said, it is 
where you are is from the point of location. It can be if you're in the mountains or if you're a backyard beekeeper, if you're in an urban or a suburban environment. So we have all of these small vari variables that we use as input to give you a recommendation back. And those recommendations are being delivered in the application. So you don't have to do anything else than inspect your bees, record an inspection, do a to-do or a record, and then the app will feed those inspections back. Every time you enter some data, you get a couple of new recommendations for yourself or a couple of recommendations from your community. So the, the HiveTrack users around you have done something similar. Yeah, one of the ways to localize the information is this concept that we've mentioned, community intelligence. And really, you know, people within the same geographic area are generally going to see a lot of the same sort of behavior. I know there's, you know, you can have quite a bit of variation even within a bee yard from hive to hive. But again, if you aggregate a bunch of data together, then when beekeepers begin to add supers in your area, then it's a pretty good bet that there's a honey flow going on, right? And so, one of the other kind of channels, if you will, of recommendations or really just notifications is what's happening in your beekeeping neighborhood. So are people, how many inspections have been done recently? Are people seeing particular stressors? And we've got kind of the typical, you know, group of, of stressors there. How many people, as I say, are adding supers? And, and so you, you get a sense of what's happening in the, in the local beekeeping community. Which for especially for newer beekeepers, that's something they they don't really have a good sense of, right? They don't have a historical beekeeping calendar in their head that they they kind of expect to follow. That that's kind of another piece of this. Over time, you'll get kind of a user generated beekeeping flow within any particular geographic region, which would be, you know, again, the, there's variations, but I'm sure you could tell me in Ohio. Kind of what's your normal time when when your spring flow happens, summer flow or whatever, you have some sort of you know notion in your head of what that should be. And then when it actually happens, you'll you know, you kind of compare it to that. So again, that's another piece of that. The maturing of this process to me, so we've got the framework in place. This would be the way to think about this. And we have some very simple models to begin with. And the idea is, you know, we send these recommendations out and then the beekeeper themselves kind of are able to say, well, that was useful or that wasn't useful. Kind of like some of these online things, even Google and others, when they give you a result for a search or a help or something, they say, was that useful or not? So we kind of have that kind of self-correcting piece in there that we're able to use to, to improve it over time. Again, I think this is the new piece of what hasn't been really anywhere before of kind of using multiple data points from the beekeeper themselves plus the community to give feedback to the beekeeper. And again, the our one of our recurring questions is or the recurring question is, what do I do next as a beekeeper? That's your that's your kind of daily task when you go to the or whenever you go to the bee yard, you go, okay, I'm taking some assessment of what's going on. What do I do next, if anything? And so equipping you with the right information to make the best decision you can at that moment in time is, is the ultimate goal. I thought a good question. I think you've already answered it. But the question is, every group has a guy who doesn't do anything like anybody else does. And he's entering the data into your system. But I think what you just said was that, yes, we've got an outlier here, but he's pretty much muffled by the other 29 people that are entering in. And although he has an effect, it's not a very big effect. Does that sound about right? Right. And that's the that's the concept, right? If you get enough data, then you'll, you will be able to identify the outliers or yeah, the ones that just don't fit with everyone else. And and it doesn't mean they're wrong. It also might be, wow, they're in an interesting spot, right? Something's different there. And and so it, it just causes you to ask more questions, which is great, you know. But that's that's the concept. Yeah, you kind of have a a line that's kind of normal. And then you can say, what's the variations off of that? And actually that's one of the concepts within the honey authentication kind of concept that we're talking about of 
you know, how much honey can you produce in a given area? There's kind of normal amounts. And then how far outside of those kind of normal boundaries are we? That's that's the concept. That's very close to the question I was going to ask in terms of honey production is the hive tracks and the new engine that you're creating and rolling out. Is it geared more for the backyard beekeeper or is there a version or a way to use it if you're a sideliner versus a commercial guy? I can imagine it could be different for different levels of beekeeping. Yes, it's absolutely different for different levels. We've discovered that in the past and, and kind of created different versions of hive tracks in the past for that. This particular one is for the hobbyist, a few hives in their backyard beekeeper. We do have, and, and that's that's our core market, right, for this particular, what we call the B2C app. And so that's that's what we're releasing first thing. But we've got in our roadmap kind of circling back to those other groups and we we already know what those groups need and how this app is going to behave, you know, in those new new contexts. And maybe we didn't, I don't think we said this this time, but this new this new version is it's mobile first. So it is a mobile app and it will have kind of a companion web app presence as well. But the your main interaction is with the app itself rather than through a web application, which is different than previous. Well, I'm guessing then I can use your data that other people have collected. I'm going to move my bees out west this year. And where's the best place to move them? I could search for that, correct? I'm not so sure you'd be able to search for that within the framework that we have. You'd be able to tune into your new community. I mean, that's that's the cool part, right? So if you move over west and you put on your Hytrax phone or your Hytrax app, all of a sudden the community intelligence that you will receive, so the little recommendations of what people are doing in the area, is no longer for your old state, but for the new state. So that's like, plus the, the blooming information you will see is also for the new state, for the new apiary. So you're able to get an idea of your new local beekeeping community through the through the beekeeping app. So let's take that as a first step before we can tell you what is the best place to move your bees to <laughs> in the US. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and you're also, get, I mean, the a natural outcome clearly would be that there would be some master data set, right? That would say this is how beekeeping is going in whatever location. And and Again, going back to that beekeeping season, if you will, right, of what that might look like for a particular region. And you've seen from beekeeping clubs, right, that you'll have their own little localized calendar of this is when we the spring starts, this is when our flows are, this is when we treat, or this is when, you know, the dearth is. And they kind of have, you know, they have some localized knowledge there. And what I would argue is that we're going to end up with that but for any place, and it's digitally backed or data backed with real observations and real data rather than the way it's been created, which is from real experience, except it's a snapshot in time, doesn't change you know, over time very well, or, or it doesn't keep up. It's not dynamic enough. And, and so like Etienne would have his season, and then we would have our season, and then Kevin Jester in MEMS, Florida would have his season, right? So, which would be all be very different. But again, if you're on the app and you're in that location, it's going to kind of match to what your what your location is and adapt to it, if you would. But to Kim's point, if he wanted to move out to Thurston County, Washington, and find the best place to drop his bees, he can't use the app to say, well, I'm going to put them right next to Jeff's house. I could foresee a tool that an apiary suitability, which we've we've batted that around, right? What if I dropped a, a hive or a yard at location X? Would it be a good spot, right? And there are lots of different layers of data that you could use to evaluate that. And in this case, if the hive tracks data was part of that evaluation process, it would would give you some insight for sure. But we would, I mean, and this isn't a good spot to talk about not <laughs> revealing sensitive information about a beekeeper. That, that that's very near and dear to our hearts of, of keeping beekeepers' data private to themselves and it only being in an aggregate, aggregate sort of sense. And even there, 
you know, there's some controls on on what what we are willing to let out. Good to hear. Good to know. But looking at that picture, then theoretically, it sounds like I could get some relatively good information on where to go, but also when to go there. Sure. Yeah. I mean that that's all part of beekeeping, right? Is is what are the what are the flow times and and that's so my my son has a sideliner business bee business that depends on multiple flows and moving you know to those flows at the right time and and that's part of his you know makes his business model successful and and similar in, in a lot of different places that that are honey producers you know you're kind of chasing the flow and whether you're in uh, Texas or North Dakota or I don't know in Yemen. And and you're chasing the, some some desert blooms somewhere, right? Or up in Alaska chasing fireweed. You know, you're yeah. you're just all over the place. Yep. And we we you know we really tried hard to say is like what are what are the sources of information to help me be guided through the season, right? We want to almost craft a story of a season together with a beekeeper, which is why we tried. It is what you do as a beekeeper. It's what other beekeepers do. It's what nature does, and it's what the weather does. So we try to, from these four different groups, try to, can we now take all of it and present it to you as, as digestible pieces of information, as actionable pieces of advice in, in an application to get smarter and be able for beekeepers to balance those different information aspects. I need to know a little bit about the weather, a little bit about the nature, a little bit about my own knowledge, and a little bit about the community knowledge to get to a point where I know what I what I want to do next as a beekeeper. And that little, you know, that balance between these four sources of information is what we work towards. And I think that the, the new app will, will, will be a good first first pass to, to help lots of beekeepers with, with t- making the right decisions. That'd be one heck of a tool. <laughs> well, Kim, some of, well, some of your questions are kind of, it depends on your perspective and who you are, what what kind of beekeeper you are, or what your what questions you're trying to ask against the data set is how I would say that, right? And and right now, we're what questions would a a beekeeper, a small scale backyard beekeeper, be asking? What what would they? What information would they need? So that's that's another way lens to look at it. Of you have this data set, and then who's asking the question, and how you deliver that information is going to depend on who's asking the question. And through the app, it's the individual small beekeeper, but the kinds of questions of what's good forage area or where are a lot of bees delivering ecosystem services like right now to almonds, right? I mean, if they are delivering pollination services in the Central Valley of California, and and that's, and that's going to result in a crop you know, at the end of that, well, any concentration of bees in any location is delivering some pollination service to that area and is having an impact, right? So again, it depends on who's who's asking the question, what lens you're looking at it, that this is going to give information to a whole host of stakeholders is another way to think about it, that this data and this information would bring value to that group and help answer their questions. But it begins with the individual beekeeper and them, us making this valuable to them, make them a better beekeeper, have healthier bees, which then that just has ripple effects, you know, across everything else downstream from that. A couple episodes ago when you were on, you talked about BXML. Is that still part of this process? Is there work on BXML and industry acceptance? Yeah, so so the BXML group is still active, and they have pretty much monthly meetings. I think to to kind of take on the next what a, what's the next piece of data that we're trying to standardize, and and they continue that process. For us, that's a very slow process. I mean, any kind of developing any kind of standard is is pretty laborious and and challenging to get people to agree on it. What we've done is taken the kind of what's the full scope of data that's possible, right, for, for beekeepers to collect. And, and there's some good examples out there already. And, and boiling that down to what are the essential pieces, and we know that this will map back into a standard, how you would think about that. And because we, we've studied, you know, what kinds of data is being collected historically, what 
looking at a lot of different data sheets and, and things like that. And there's the Beep project that has this really nice data wheel of, of all different kinds of data that you might collect. And, and again, so we're not constrained to that BXML because we know that what we end up with is going to map into that well. That's all good to hear because I'm a kind of a data nerd in many ways, whether I'm on a bicycle or on a, my bees. I have some sort of gauge or monitor. And, and the problem with the beekeeping right now, I shouldn't say a problem, but one of the challenges I have as a data nerd and a beekeeper is that I can't use the data from one sensor and combine it with the information from another sensor in one dashboard on my computer screen and make sense of it or have it work together. And that's what I would really like to see. You know, if I was God and king of the world, I would like to see that ultimately, and regardless of what sensor I had. So I wouldn't have to stay with one sensor manufacturer. I could. Well, if, if you've got $100 million to invest and create <laughs> the company that can buy up all the sensor providers, we'll unify them all for you. Let me check with the wife. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Jeff, there there is another project that it's actually funded by the European Commission that we are on with High Track that is called World Fair. And I'm not sure if you've heard about the fair principles in, in data, you know, being definable, accessible, interoperable, and 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 producible to look into data sets and finding. And we're in the working group that is an agrobiodiversity, so plant pollinator interactions in particular. And here again, it's just, you know, the part of the work that we're doing is to, as, as James was saying, to always make sure that we can track back to the standard, right? The standard is kind of to be created that everybody, if you're in, you know, an IoT company or you're a software company, there is a way to translate your data into that standard that it could be put together with, with, with other data sets. So for us, it's really important to contributing to those standardization processes and always to know if they're, whether it's fair criteria or it's, it's BXML criteria to be able to map that back at a, at a given time to take more and more use case of it. Because if not, we will just end up or continue to be in our little silos and the added value of the data being collected is, is going to be very limited. You know, being a data nerd and liking data, the challenge there is actually collecting that data and entering that data. And and that's that's been the, you know, the barrier, if you will, over the years. And and that's where I kind of retooled and rethinking on hive tracks. What can we what's the fewest data points that we can can collect and still be effective in giving good advice? So you have to kind of back off from the real science side of it and collecting everything that a, an experimental you know, project would, would require. And instead, what can we expect to get you know, from an everyday beekeeper? That's not, again, not, it's not going to be a heavy lift for them. It's going to be easy to use and enjoyable for them and give value back to them. And, and so we want somebody like Kim to be able to use the app in the, in the bee yard and it be useful to, to him and, and also be of service, again, to the broader community because Kim has a lot of experience and the things that he's doing are, you know, going to be helpful to those people around him that, you know, are less experienced. Good answer. I appreciate that. I don't know if I'm changing the subject here or not, but when I go visit your webpage, and by the way, I recommend everybody listening to go look at their webpage. It's a ton of information out there that you can use to expand what you already know and to get introduced to the new products that they're dealing with. But prominent on that webpage is the word blockchain. And I hear that here and there, and I read Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and The Economist magazine, and, and I, I see that word. I still don't know what it means. What are you using that word for? What is that describing so that when the people listening to this see this on your webpage, you're going to go, ah, I see how that works. Is that a fair question? That's a very fair question. And first of all, pardon the pun, it is a buzz word. <laughs> and a lot of people use it as a buzz word to get attention just in this current technology mindset that we're in. Max, I'll let you explain if you want. Yeah, I think the, the easiest way to to not create more confusion, it's always it's always a little bit hard, but think of maybe a a database you can only write to. Think about it like that. It's it's a way to store 
and you can only write to it, right? It just gets longer and longer. You can only write to it. And that gives the advantage that any type of information that is being written to this database or to, to the storage system will always be there. It will forever be there. And that's, I think, the, the, the easiest way to handle it. And the, the, the interesting, there's, there's a lot more. I'm trying to be as, as simple as it, as it, as it can get. There's a lot to how, uh, how it is being stored, that it's it's being stored across, there's copies of it in many, 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 many different places. So nobody could could just change something in it. So there's a few mechanisms to make sure you can only write to it and not, not delete from it. But the interesting aspect of it is that it enables a lot of new services because of the fact that information can only be stored. So this, again, is something we 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 talked about a little bit earlier today. Think about... The beekeeping season. Think about what it means during a season, what you ought to be doing during the season to know that your bees are doing well and that you've produced enough honey at the end of the season, as an example. You will leave a story, right? Your interactions with the beehive create a story. There may be eight inspections during the year, it may be six, there may be one or two treatments, there may be one or two feedings. And all of these points together stored to a database that can't be changed becomes a profile for your honey that could authenticate where it came from. And if we knew that this data, the the the, the type of interactions that you had with your beehive over time in these different places, that information gets stored and I could look that up, that would tell me that where your honey comes from exactly, and it would help with the traceability of your honey. And that's one of the areas that we are looking, we are looking into, we are working on just this notion of you can't alter the data after the fact. That gives a lot of opportunity to authenticate where your honey came from, to authenticate how much your bees were flying, or even to authenticate your data vis-a-vis -vis other, other actors out there. So that's 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 one way how we would use this and a very simple way to explain what blockchain. Well, believe it or not, that makes an awful lot of sense in past conversations I've had with honey importers and where they get their honey and how they prove that it came from there and the data that is collected on site and then the data is collected when it comes to the border, and then the data is collected when it gets to the packer's house. So that blockchain is used in that industry a lot also, and suddenly it makes sense. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> can, 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 here, let me, give, let me give my simple version as well, if you want. A blockchain is a storage technology that is acts as an immutable ledger, meaning that it's you can write down data, events, whatever kind of data, like a ledger, like you would write down transactions, and it is immutable. So that's the part where it can't be changed and it can't be tampered with. It's encrypted in such a way that it would be impossible for it to be tampered with. And that's the simplest explanation of what it how it functions. And so then anything that you write down on it, you can be sure that it will not be tampered with. And that's that's the key to it. And, and so when you apply, use that storage technology for what we were just talking about with supply chains, and you've, you've got those data points that you trust along the way, that's the other part, that the data that you trust and you put it onto the blockchain and that it's accurate, then it will never get modified. There's no way for someone to go and, and change that, that information. It can't be changed, but it can be gathered. Is that a good way to put it? I can use the information there, but I can't oh, yes. change it? Okay. Correct. That's what I mean by immutable ledger. You can write stuff down, but you can't go back and erase the, the, the zero and put a two, right, if it's a, if it's a ledger like that. And, and that's, that's really what it is. It gives us a tool. That's, it's a storage tool. It's a storage technology. And for us, and, and most of the people are using it, it that's, that's what its function is, is a storage tool that makes the data that's being stored there secure and we can trust it. That's, that's the concept is you're trying to get, generate trust. And the blockchain storage technology 
is a way to build trust. You still have to deal with the original data source and where it came from and, and make sure that that is trustworthy information to put on it. But it, it doesn't make it doesn't magically make the data that's there correct, right? It just it just locks in whatever's there can't be changed. Kim, my simplest explanation is it's chiseled in stone. <laughs> Good way to put it. That's a great one. There you go. There you go. Lots of stones. It's, 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 hey, I yeah, like lots of about chiseled in digital stone. I like that. <laughs> okay. Well, we've lost all the beekeepers here because we're no longer yeah. talking about bees. <laughs> we're coming up the end of our time, guys. Is there anything we haven't asked you about that you want to mention at this point in time? Yeah, I think there's there, there's one little thing. So of course, you know, we are our, our new app is just about there. So it's 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 today one of these very few close days. It's it's something quite inter- interesting and have a look. But there's something else that we're 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 doing, and that is a, a crowd equity campaign. So we're we're going to have a big crowdfunding campaign that launches here in the next few days, where with a an investment of just a hundred dollars, people can can support. So looking into what we do, and this is not a crowdfunding like a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo. So it's an actual investment that allows anybody who would you know like to support and become part of the Hacktrex community as a as an investor as a stakeholder with a very normal amount is it would be very welcome to do so. And of course, there's lots of information on that on our website, but that's maybe the one other thing that would be need to to get out here today. Well, definitely. Well, there you go, folks. You can have a, a chance to be a, an investor in Hivetrax. We'll provide a link to that, to Hivetrax, and to even to that in the show notes to the episode. Well, James and Max of Hivetrax, really appreciate having you on the show today. It's good to get caught up. You guys are on the leading edge of everything that's digital and beekeeping, and I really like that. I think that's it's a fun place to be as a data nerd that I am. <laughs> yeah, we'll compare notes on that. No, but thanks a lot for having us. This was phenomenal. Yes, it, it's a fun place to be, and and it's it's always an adventure. Let's say, given how technology changes, and and you know, yeah, just the dynamic nature of it, and then throw in the dynamic nature of beekeeping and beekeepers themselves and the industry, and yeah, never a dull moment. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, look forward to having you back next spring and finding out how this goes and see what's uh, in store for Hive Tracks in uh, the coming months. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. It's been fun, guys. Thank Thank you. you. Same here. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, y'all. It was good to see James back again this spring. And Hive Tracks, he's always on the bleeding edge of technology and, and expanding what Hive Tracks can do. Yes, I like following them and and seeing what they're doing and what's coming up next. And this one was bordering on science fiction almost. It's in the technology involved and and the data that they're collecting and how they're using that data. And now I know what blockchain means. (laughs) (laughs) And you can describe it, too. I can, yes. I've gained something worthwhile today, without a doubt. Go visit their webpage because there's a lot of good information there and it doesn't going to cost you a ton of money and it's going to be worth a million dollars. We were talking offline or off the recording. The other work they're doing in in developing countries, the use of the the application in other ways in other countries, it's really neat and really, really cool. So I would encourage you to take a look at what Hivetrax is doing and I'm glad to have them on the show. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Global Patties and Strong Microbials and Better Bee for their longtime support of this podcast. Thanks to Hive Alive for returning this spring and thanks to Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Check out all of their books at www.northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.